I have in my lifetime wrestled with having high, high expectations for all things under the sun. I have wanted to have the best this, the best that, the best experience. I wanted to have it this when I got to that. And you know what I've had a thousand times that's followed those things that I've had my expectations dashed, as you do. Because when you're young, how could you know what's coming next? You really can't. And yet, we base so much of our life and our energy in seeking hard to have ourselves um, expect what's going to come. And then it turns out that we don't actually know. We looked at this passage yesterday at fives. We began to talk about this because this is where my headspace was preparing for tonight. But Luke 2, 48 through 51 is the story of Jesus in the temple. And I just want to sort of put that out there without giving too much more. But you know the story likely is that Jesus, when he was 12, his family goes back and they go to Jerusalem to adhere to the Passover rituals and they travel this great distance. And a couple things to note before we think more about this is that uh, in ancient Israel, they were a strong group culture. And what that is different than us is that we are what's called a radical individualist culture. It means that we have our fences, right? We have our people, we have our stuff. And those things are not yours, they're mine. And you have your things and I have my things. And we're cordial, but we're radical individualists. My stuff is my stuff. And so as they're traveling, they're traveling not as radical individuals who have their carpools, right? Their caravans. They're traveling as families who uh, are extended families and they all belong to one another. And so as they get to Jerusalem and they go through the routines, it's conceivable then that Mary and Joseph can turn back around and go, yeah, I don't know where my son is, but I'm sure he's up in this group somewhere. We're just going to start heading back. And, and my son Jesus will know to come back because he's with this larger extended family. And so trusting that that was going to happen, they were like, well, we'll find him along the way. And so they start heading back after all the Passover festivities. And three days go by and they don't find him and they start to panic. And so they do what you, your parents told you when you were young and went to an amusement park. When you get lost, just stay where you are. We'll come back and find you. And sure enough, they come to the temple and they find Jesus. And so that's where we want to pick it up. It says this. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why are you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Right there. One of the things that's exposed here is that Mary had a set of expectations. And this is the generous, gracious process of those expectations, specifically here, expectations for being a mother, but also for being a mother of the Messiah, Jesus. And so he continues, and they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them, and he went down with them, and he came to Nazareth, and he was submissive to them, and his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And it feels like that's a really polite way of saying she registered, wow, what just happened? What is this? This is not what I expected. I think that Jesus is actually quite in the business of helping us admit that, oh, you had an expectation for me, didn't you? You had hoped I would fit into that box, that set of categories. You had hoped that I would be perhaps a genie. Oh, listen, I'm not a genie. And since I love you, you're not in trouble for thinking that. Like, I understand that. But you do need to learn. And I do need to dash that expectation See, here's the thing about expectations, is that expectations are often under-informed by experience. Just read that for a second. Expectations are often under-informed by experience, and that becomes a problem. It means that we cannot trust our expectations. Anybody in here ever had a friend or a roommate who their expectations were too high? Just raise your hand. Don't nudge anybody. 
but if anybody ever had a, somebody who was in a relationship, just wow, that is a really exceptionally high expectation for this thing, right? What's that like? That's stifling. You can't be who you are. It's a tremendous burden. You are not free to be you. You're needing to please that person or they get hurt or they're gone or they're sad or they're depressed or worse, they're suicidal or angry or addicted to something and they're putting the burden of that on you. I think that the, the same can be said about God in terms of us. We're the ones who tend to have way too high expectations or expectations that just have nothing to do with who he is and what he's all about. And we bring that to the table. And I think he is in the business of helping us see that those expectations are under-informed. Expectations make us lose our perspective on things that are really important. Consider the first moment, whether you're a senior or whether you're a freshman, the first moment you decided, I am going to Biola. In that moment, you were filled with expectations about what you thought was going to be happening here. Now, for, for good or for bad, for good or for bad, those expectations have been dashed. Yes? Yes? Is this what, it, what you thought it was going to be? It, it may be really good. It's not to say that it, just because it's not what you expected, it's not to say that it was bad. It's, it's just to say that it was different. It's not what you thought it would be. On one hand, Biola is exciting and it's doctorally unwavering and it's, it's on message and it's about the classes and the resources here at the university. You live an experience of this. But on the other hand, Biola is a struggle. Maybe you're not best friends with your roommate like you kind of thought you would be. You realized that you expected more. Maybe you were in love when you came here and you left somebody behind and it's not going as well as you had expected. Maybe the Bible classes and the social life, maybe the whole thing is not turning out like you had hoped. I want to talk specifically about three identity-based expectations that skew our understanding of God, ourselves, and about relationships in general. And by extension then, even our time here at Biola. And I think part of growth then is going to be for us to begin to face like Mary had to face, oh, I had an expectation there. To identify the expectation, but then also to move through the expectation so that you can move towards openness to whatever comes next. So these are three identity-based um, expectations that kind of skew our experience. Uh, that's not the slide, nor is that. Nor is that. Nor is, oh, I'm going backwards. Just two buttons. It was too hard for me. <laughs> there it is. The expectation that spiritual feelings will deliver you. That one's going to crush you. Okay? The expectation that relationships, romantic or otherwise, will describe you. In other words, it's going to describe to others who you are. Oh, you're the person who's with those people, with that person. And the expectation that great insight will define you. And so for you at Biola, for your, your quest is essentially this, that I will have, I will find great uh, emotion for God, that I will find uh, a person, that I will find great insight. And those things are going to be the things that are going to make me who I am. So quickly to the first one, the expectation that spiritual feelings will deliver you. The statement that you would make to yourself about this one is, I am doing okay because I feel God. I'm doing okay because I feel God is a statement that goes with this first one. Um, yeah, this is a dangerous one. This is a dangerous one. Because as much as we want to say that the goal is to always have a spiritual high, you know that the, 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 the Garden of Gethsemane, just for instance, is a time where Jesus didn't feel God but he was still called to be right where he was at. The early church is defined by martyrs. You know who they are? They're people who don't feel God, and yet they were called to be right where they are. It seems that God asks us at times to follow him, even if it's not easy, even if we don't feel him. And so if our spiritual quest is to always be feeling God, to have a spiritual high, then it is possible that we are going to miss something that he is asking us to pick up on. 
a common experience is that we can worship, go to worship or teaching and have great conversations to give us that spiritual high. And that spiritual high becomes, at times, our only gauge for whether or not there's success here. That's like the only thing that's giving me any feedback is if I'm doing okay, is if I feel really good about God. If I feel something, then it was success. Listen, let's just be honest here. You will walk away from tonight and you'll go, hmm, was tonight good? Uh, Let's see. Did I feel anything about tonight? Did I feel spiritually high about something? If I did, then After Dark was off the chain. If I didn't, yeah, it was okay. It was okay. And so we use the gauge of emotion for God to be um, our gauge of success. And we bring this tremendous set of expectations to God. And what I would say to you is this. What if you come to After Dark or Inspiration or Fives or Midday or Morning Chapel uh, and you don't have that expectation? You know what you're doing? You know what you're saying? You're saying, God, you can show up and grow me however you want to do it. Why? Because you're God. I'm going to be open to you if you want to grow me through hard times or a a season of dryness. God, I'm going to be open to you and I'm going to be obedient to you even if I feel spiritually dry. See, what we do is we, we feel that dryness and then we sort of pull back from God and say, I don't know if I'm really going to do this. And I don't think that we want to be doing that, but oftentimes that's what's happening. I talked to dozens of students who sense that they're feeling spiritually numb, and so they come here trying to manufacture feelings. I understand this. I want this. But those feelings are a gift, and if you are getting them, then open your hearts wide open to God because he is giving those to you. But if you're not feeling them, C.S. Lewis talks about this brilliantly in the screw tape letters. He says it's like a parent who removes his hand so that a baby can learn to walk. God is trying to grow us, and he does it in a lot of different ways. Sometimes he gives us spiritual feelings in order to grow us, and sometimes he takes them away. Let's give him the freedom to do that. Takeaway on this point, when you walk away from here asking yourself if you thought tonight was good based on whether or not you felt God, catch yourself in that moment. Just catch yourself. Be gentle with yourself. Don't get into a whole cycle of guilt and shame, but ask a better question. Did you learn anything about yourself or God or his creation or others? That's a better way to get at it. When somebody asks you, was it good? Don't ask the question, did you feel? Often self-awareness is painful, but it's necessary. A second one that we looked at there Is it relationships, romantic or otherwise? I think I'm going to probably lean more towards romantic because that is a big deal and it pretty much defined my time here uh, trying to chase after um, that whole thing. But the statement that you would say with this one, the corresponding statement would be this, I'm doing okay because this person, this relationship is proof that I'm loved and valued. And so you have an expectation that a person can do that. And don't you know, don't you see that God would want to frustrate that expectation for your own good? Because nobody can, no person can bear the weight of that. Only God can tell you who you are. And so um, this one is really hard. This one feels like to me, at least when I was here, everybody could say everybody else was doing that whole um, putting their expectations in some relationship, defining them. But, but that's not me. But it's everybody else is doing that. But you know, privately, I was doing that too. Uh, if I wasn't dating somebody, I was wanting to date somebody. If I wasn't wanting to date somebody, I was, you know, wanting to want to date somebody. <laughs> Biola, you know you're at Biola when everybody likes somebody, but nobody's asking anybody out, right? <laughs> you know you're at Biola. When that's happening. Family talk, right? Real. It's real talk. I'm glad things haven't changed in 20 years. I remember sitting at my graduation on Metzger Lawn, looking at the speaker going, huh, I had really thought I would meet her here. And I hadn't. 
Anchoring, anchoring yourself to this one, to this relationship, is like being anchored in a hurricane. It's up and it's down, and it spins you until you're dizzy. I came to Biola with a broken heart. In part, I came here because I had a broken heart, and I wanted to kind of run from those feelings. I tried dating, but I was so anxious, and I was so in my head about these things. I was concerned what others thought about me, and if I went on too many dates, would I get a reputation for just going out with too many different people? It was crazy. Biola at that time was about half the size that it is now, and so it just felt like if you feel like you know everybody now, when it was 2,000 people, it was way more uh, sort of like a, people knew if you were dating on, on the scene. This expectation is pretty hard to avoid. I don't have a lot of advice to give, but I, I have some advice to help you cope. And that is just this, broaden your relationship core. Have more relationships with more people. Process this with people. Have quality relationships so that you are being fulfilled on multiple fronts with multiple kinds of friendship. Because your soul just needs to be filled with the goodness of God. And that often comes through your relationships with people, your healthy relationships with people. And so if this is your quest, just understand that this expectation, God is trying to dash that expectation for good reason. The third one, and the final one, is a great insight will define you. And the statement you would make here with this one is that I'm okay because I finally realized something important. Like we're all constantly standing here, we're going to class, we're going to chapel, we're listening to sermons, we're listening to podcasts, and we're sort of subtly but not so subtly just like waiting for that one insight light bulb to just go off and then, then it's gonna deliver me. Then I will have arrived at that where? Where? Aren't we all lifelong learners? I think we're gonna be learning when we get to be with God still. Something more about him, new every day. Why is this insight thing and this arrival with insight so important to us? But it is, it's important to me too. For the sake of time, I'll just say this, that Biola is an insight mill. There are incredibly important ideas floating around here. Daily, we can feel the weight of those. Professors, they drop truth bombs and then pull back the curtain and show you what happens if you or society doesn't uh, live those truth bombs out. The devastation that will happen. It can be overwhelming and you can feel like it's a competition to see who can hold as many of these types of truths as possible. But due to the nature of the weight of those ideas, the right answers cannot simply just be memorized. And this is important. This is a how we learn problem. It's not what we learn. If it was only about what we learn, then the whole project of life would simply be to just memorize the right facts. But memorization doesn't lead to wisdom. When you're studying your Bible classes, you're not simply memorizing a periodic table. The Bible scripture is the living word of God. It's not multiplication tables to just gut it out and just get it in you. You don't learn to pray to God by somebody just describing it to you. The problem with insight alone is that insight is not wisdom. As you are journeying here through Biola, do not get insight confused with wisdom. If you're setting your expectations that you're gonna gain insight so that you will be somebody important. Listen, it's wisdom that makes you important, not insight. At Biola, we have answers to questions that we haven't even asked yet. Let's learn to ask the questions so that we can live into the answers and it can have meaning and we can have wisdom. The, the, the hard thing is that we are, we're, we're learning from professors who have a good bit of the wisdom because they ask the right questions and then lived into those answers and then they just get to the end and they give you the answers, but you never lived the journey. The important piece for you is to live into the answers. What might it take to run a marathon? That's a great question. You could look up the answer on the internet right now. And if you looked up the answers and even memorized the answers, would you be prepared to run a marathon? No. The only way to prepare yourself is to live into the answer. Ask yourself for this one, is my posture in class, just hurry up and tell me the answer. 
or tell me what to think, professor. Or, Professor, what's your position on this? I, I need to know so that I can have that be my position too. If that's what you're doing, that's an expectation that you have that is probably going to get toppled over. Because God is asking you to learn wisdom, not just insight. I will say that we learn through the rhythms that we live. And I just want to conclude with this. Go back to the beginning of Luke 2 where Mary had some expectations, she had to confront them. Why are you searching for me, Jesus, he said. Jesus said that to, her, to them. Why are you searching for me? What a great, what a great confronting, confronting question. She's got all these answers, right? The right answers are that, well, because you're my son. No, but he's asking a better question. What expectation do you have of me? Oh, oh listen, listen. I'll go with you. I'll submit to you, but mom, I need you to know that you've got some expectations and you need to confront them. I love you, mom. Let's go. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.